Hey everyone, welcome to Group Text. We have a very special episode. We're gonna talk about the funeral for Queen Elizabeth II. And who better, I mean seriously, to break down the pomp, circumstance, and all the points in between than Roberta Fiorito and Rachel Bowie of the Royally Obsessed podcast. Hi, we're all a little tired from watching. Oh, hi, thanks for having us. Yeah, a little, little tired after our early wake up call. Now, what time did you guys start? I was up at 4 a.m. I wanted to be like showered and prepared. And we had some various media appearances that we were doing this morning while covering it as well. So it was a lot of moving parts. <laughs> oh, I bet. See, I'm on the West Coast. So I was up at 2.30. Oh, gosh. You Ooh, definitely beat oh, us. Man. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and I kept thinking, well, I'm recording it. So I can go back to sleep. And it's just it didn't happen. Okay. So many questions. <laughs> Okay. So many. First of all, it was amazing. Nobody does pomp and circumstance like the British. Truly. I mean, that's what the commentators kept saying was it was the royal family, especially. That's the pageantry that we all know and love. And I think Rachel and I especially were so tuned into that aspect of it. Very much so. We all know that Charles is now King Charles III. Camilla is now the queen consort. William and Kate are now the princess and princess of Wales. Okay, walk me through who else has gotten new titles. I don't know that there have any other titles been given out. The line of succession has been updated on the website. I know that much. Roberta, are there any other new titles? I guess the kids you could consider their addition of Wales as their last name is technically new because they're no longer like Prince George and Prince Charlotte of Cambridge. They're now Prince George, Prince Charlotte, Prince Louis of Wales. So they do have to go by their new last name at school, which they just started last two weeks ago, I guess. Um, that'll, that'll confuse a bunch of second graders. Exactly. <laughs> I, I, I think, think it was that, the first day, I right. guess that timing, I mean, it's unfortunate timing. You never want this to happen. Of course, we thought the queen would live forever, but I think they could start as the Waleses because Charles yeah. did it so immediately. Now, I had always heard that the Duke and Duchess or uh, Edward and Sophie, and Sophie is the queen's favorite daughter-in-law, is what we've always heard, were then going to be made the Duke and Duchess of Edinburgh, which was Philip's old title. Mm -hmm. Do we think yes, that's going to happen? Yes, I heard that too. My understanding is that a lot of this, I think even Charles, someone in the King's household has asked for a little bit of patience and time, because I think there are also questions around Archie and Lilibet in terms of if they're, they will receive official prince and princess titles, but all of that, I think in due time, the prince and princess of Wales title change happened much more rapidly than Roberta and I expected. I mean, it was immediate, immediate. Yeah, Why it could be even for reasons like the kids at school and just them starting their first day was the day before the queen passed. So I think maybe even just logistically, it helps them with that transition. They've had so many transitions. They moved to the grounds of Windsor. So it's just a lot at one time. And I think that probably does help. There's also rumors, I guess, that Princess Anne will be getting an elevated title, which I have no idea. I've racked my brain for what that could be. She is now she's princess royal, which is always given to the daughter of the monarch. So I'm not sure what she would get next, but supposedly that's. But what in that's like queue. one of the highest. What are they going to what's left to give her? I can't figure it out. <laughs> Rachel and I will have to speculate on our podcast, but I I'm not sure. I was thinking maybe she could be the Duchess of Edinburgh if but it is. Technically, I think it's supposed to go to Edward and Sophie, those Edinburgh titles. So I don't know. We'll and, have to see what Charles comes up with. And they seem to seem to have been in the last decade, the ones she's closest to. Mm -hmm. Edward and Sophie, especially Sophie is what I've heard. Yeah, yes. I mean, I feel like we've seen her a lot um, by the Queen's side, and I think especially in these moments of sort of peacemaking where she is also with the Sussexes and the now Waleses um, and seems to play that role really well as far as just being a level-headed kind of intermediary between everyone. So yeah, I can see why she would definitely be one of the queen's favorites. So I want to loop back to something you said about the Sussexes children because a lot of, like, including Anne, chose not to have her children have titles. 
That was her choice. Why it's just Peter Phillips and Zara Tyndall. So first Harry and Meghan said, we don't want them to have tight. We don't want him to have a title. Then it came out. She's like, and no one even offered it yet. They automatically get titles when, or have the right to titles once their grandfather is king. So what was all that drama about? Well, I think the fact that they weren't immediately given them, it's all the security protection that comes with it. And also, we still don't know if they will officially get them and what that protocol means. I think there are so many questions surrounding that. And this is something that we've gotten to know a lot more of because of Harry's lawsuit over the security But I and the conversations from Oprah. But I think that this is something that the details of were still kind of becoming more knowledgeable about. I, I just find it puzzling when you don't work for the company anymore, you're not entitled to the benefits. And since the taxpayers pay for the security and you're not working for the government basically anymore, why do you, I mean, to me, there's, there's a missing logical step here. Yeah. I think one of the most important aspects of that is that the Sussexes children will always be the grandchildren of the monarch. I mean, he is the reigning King, King Charles III, Archie and Lilibet are his grandchildren. So I think that it's probably a decision that will be left up to them behind closed doors. At least that's what we hope is that they make that decision. Obviously, like you said, Anne made that decision for her children to have a more private life because if they don't have the titles, they do have a little bit more privacy. And so we'll see if that's what they decide, but it, yeah, it is uh, up in the air for right now. So who now becomes, who gets Cornwall, which was Camilla's old title? Well, wasn't that the one that was given to the Cambridges immediately, Cornwall? Yeah. Was and it? Then, the it would, then they were, yes. Yeah, so right when the queen passed, the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge became the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge and Cornwall. And then they were elevated immediately to Prince and Princess of Wales. And there was that big social media changeover. And that's the, their official role now. So what I don't think how we how could we refer to them as anything else okay. once they have those but titles. But then who gets <laughs> yeah. Cambridge and Cornwall now that they're Wales? Or they is it just kind of they, they're just in the back pocket there. Yeah. It's like all these titles, just like um, you know, we have other titles for the royals when they're in Scotland or or Ireland. There's all these titles. So it seems like for now the Waleses also retain the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge and Cornwall. Ay, too confusing. Now, <laughs> the other thing, according to the Daily Mail, which I have been reading every day religiously. It's not just the titles that are shuffling. There's all sorts of homes and palaces that are shuffling. Mm -hmm. So. Yes. The big first question is, is, are Charles and Camilla going to actually live in Buckingham Palace? It seems likely. I yeah. think that that's what so much of this is unfolding it, minute to minute, day by day. But that seems like the trajectory that will happen. I think our big question is also the fact that Prince William and Kate recently relocated it as in a week before this happened to Windsor to in theory, be in close proximity to queen Elizabeth to also have a quieter countryside life. And they are in Adelaide college, Adelaide cottage. And I think the question is, will they move into Windsor castle? There's a lot of uh, real estate changeovers about to happen, I believe. But also yeah, it does. Windsor okay. is on the Heathrow flight path. And yes. everyone complains like nobody wants to live there because all you hear is jets going over. Very true. Yeah. You got to soundproof those, those old palace walls, I guess, or castle walls. Yeah. I think Clarence house will definitely um, see a lot of change because they don't see Charles and Camilla living there anymore. If they have their Buckingham palace location, that's really like the offices is where they'll be located is Buckingham palace. Um, just like moving into the queen's offices. And so it wouldn't make sense to have a second London location, but we know how passionate Charles is about Highgrove, which is his country estate. And, you know, he has organic farming. He keeps bees there. He's sustainable. It's like farm to table. So 
he'll definitely retain high grove most likely, um, and the gardens there, he's especially passionate about, um, but we'll have to see what happens to some of those other residences as news unfolds. Well, and one asterisk to add to this conversation is that as I was penning my snail mail condolences to the family this week, which is always, um, I, I send for all the birthdays, all that stuff, the address for the Prince and Princess of Wales is actually sending it to Clarence house, which threw me for a loop. I had to triple check on multiple places because I was confused why it wouldn't be Kensington Palace. So I'm just confusing all of us even more, but that was my head scratcher of the week. <laughs> so now my mom was friends. Yes. We want to know more about Charles this. And, Camille, and there's a special code you actually have to put on the mail for what? it to get to them. Mm, what oh, is the code? I have Will no you idea. <laughs> we need that information. But there's a special code. So it actually gets to them. That makes sense. Not just lumped in. But I want to go. There's going to be thousands of letters. Yeah. Yeah. Want, well, Millions. I was like thinking to myself, I'm like, what do you even write? Like, I'm so sorry for your loss and congratulations on the promotion. Like, it's a very <laughs> weird. Like, what do you say? I mean, I had to sit down and really think about it. I tried to be as detailed as possible and talk about the events of the week and how, you know, just in terms of what they've been navigating also as parents. I think that's been something that stuck out to Roberta and I is just how difficult it must be to have, you know, I mean, George and Charlotte participated today. So all of those different things. Which we're going to get to that in a minute. But yes. I got one more question about real estate. Charles <laughs> has talked about slimming down the monarchy. And who's getting graph, basically. So is Andrew gonna be streeted from Royal Lodge? Is he should he should he be on Zillow looking? <laughs> I think he probably will be able to stay in Royal Lodge. The bigger question in our minds, I think, is whether he'll be so front and center as he's been in these kind of the morning period and the funeral, because I feel like he has been so visible, obviously his mother is the queen. And so he's been in that lineup with the children each time, but moving forward, it feels like maybe they're going to change pace and have him take really behind the scenes if any role at all. Um, he's probably going to lay really, really low. I think that's what public sentiment is kind of dictating right now. I don't know if Rachel, you feel the same. I can't yeah, imagine, I, mean, I can't imagine them, him coming back. I mean, I no, know. I don't think he can. And I don't no. think any of us want him to. No, but I thought it was, um, it was clearly, I think that was one of the things that reminded us all that they're a family. Also, which I noticed is they didn't, they all walked in a straight, all walked lined up, not with Charles ahead. Mm -hmm. Which I thought for was- For which part? For which part? When they were following the, the casket. Oh, yes. When they mm -hmm. all four kids walked in a line. They're not kids. They're all adults. I mean, for God's yeah. sake, Charles is in his that, 70s. Yeah. But all the siblings walked that too. in a line where traditionally the monarch would be first. Yeah. My thoughts were that, and I, I noticed that and thought, that's interesting because usually Charles is now elevated above his siblings. But I think what a funeral of a parent does is creates a great equalizer between the kids and in, in that there are just a tier of children. Then there's the tier of grandchildren, then great grandchildren. It just feels like because it's more about the queen than it is about the next King that maybe we're just seeing all the children kind of in the same um, level. Well, and it also gave a very powerful photo to see all their faces. I don't know if that played into it because they're all about the visuals as we know. That's what I was going to say yeah. is it, it was, you, you could tell so much of this was set for the photos, but I was shocked that they allowed so many of their own emotions to show. There certainly wasn't a whole bunch of stiff upper lip happening as you normally see it with the Royals. I really loved that part. And I think, you know, it kind of speaks to potentially what the type of monarchy we're about to see is. I think Charles is always a little bit more outwardly emotional and he has been throughout his whole life. So maybe that's something that's a real positive to come from his reign. I thought that was a bright spot in today and uh, just the outward display of emotion. I mean, he yeah, really he looked like he was going to break down every time they sang God save the King now. Yeah. You have to have so much sympathy. I think for this, these, this family that's under a microscope and has been for the past 11 days, I think it's, it has to be incredibly difficult to have know that the world is watching you at every given moment. And so I think that that also plays into the fact that 
they've been under a lot of, of attention and stress for the past, you know, over a week. So I think that that's got to, got to play into it too. I don't think I could hold it. Even those lengthy walks. I think that that just seems so hard and you have literally the world watching. I thought it was, I mean, it, it, it was everything you wanted it to be. I mean, all, but I agree. Yeah. It was just though today was so long. I couldn't look away though. I really could not look away. Like I tried to like do some other things and I was still in, I was in sitting in front of my TV for six hours at least. So the seating within uh, Westminster Abbey, who does the seating chart? And I know that there's protocol and precedence and, you know, there's an order that everyone has to walk in and status and, you know, all the children were given higher status than the whales who should have technically been right after the monarch. Who figures this all out? So there's actually a really simple answer and it's one guy, it's the Duke of Norfolk and he is a hereditary position. So his father before him helped plan the King's funeral, I believe King George VI's funeral. And so it's passed down through generations and it. They've also a fun fact about them is they're also Catholic. So I feel like they're very used to um, pageantry and pomp and circumstance too, and religious aspects of the funeral that were involved. And it's, so it's, it's just this guy um, who plans all of it. And he said, when they first started planning, there was 20 people in the planning room and they met once a year. And now it grew to over 200 people that are involved in that um, behind closed doors. Because I was going to say, what if he's really bad at organizing, you know, <laughs> seating charts? It's hard enough when you have a dinner party where everybody should sit. I mean, I, I couldn't even imagine the, the the transportation involved in getting the pallbearers from place to place. Like, I just, my mind was blown by the buses. They had everyone bust in. It's just the logistics are a nightmare to imagine. Well, and you think about the royal family, but then you have all these dignitaries from around the world. And I was listening to some of the coverage where it's, you know, there's a lot of situations where certain people can't sit near people because of bigger world events that are going on. And I think just being the person in charge of that, hope they're having a nice um, gin and tonic tonight. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah. that or they've medicated and gone to sleep already. Yes. So, okay, I heard, and I, please correct me if you're, if I'm wrong that the Bidens were in like row 14 behind some like smaller countries. Like was it alphabetical and were a U and not an A? I mean, what was that I did about? hear there were just following on social media. Some commentators said that they saw them going in, but then they didn't see them after. And I agree. I didn't see them during the service, at least in the feeds I was watching, but I have no idea. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know, but I did see that they released pictures actually today, which I think they just waited a while to release of the reception last night. And there's a photo of the Bidens meeting um, Kate, the King Charles III and Camilla and Kate and William. And so there was pictures, plenty of pictures from last night of them kind of handshaking and things, but I don't know where they sat. I, I would suspect they'd be kind of prominent, but there's so many Royal family members too. I mean, the Royal family section alone. And then on the opposite side of the aisle was all the uh, Royals of other countries. So they were the most prominent people there. Yeah. Cause it seemed I weird. Also- it seemed weird that you couldn't really see the Bidens and then yeah. I'm like, Oh, they're in front. They're next to the president of Hungary. I'm like, Wow. That, you know. I feel like my eyes were trained on royal faces because when we saw Charles Spencer, my mouth dropped. I was like, oh, my gosh, thinking of the history of, you know, Diana's funeral, of course, and the remarks that he had made at Windsor, Westminster Abbey. So I think I was maybe in the royal brain, but it sounds like we just didn't see the Biden. I didn't during see that. Charles yeah. Spencer. Yeah. I thought, was it uh, Juan he was Carlos, at Windsor? Uh, Juan Carlos of Spain. Oh, mm, and Letizia, Queen Letizia, yes. who is just so stunning. stunning. Yeah. Stunning. Yeah, it was uh, interesting to see what all the other European monarchs kind of wore and how they act. I mean, they were all there, which is, uh, when is the last time that happened? I don't think ever. But when was it, which which Spanish king, the one that abdicated, that's like under like a million lawsuits and sexual harassment suits, and the Spanish government asked him not to go and they went anyway? (laughs) 
I read a little bit about that. Yes. <laughs> it's like, you know, you just can't, everyone has that family member. Yeah. It's just, I don't It's care. like a wedding. It's like a wedding. Yeah. And they were sitting right in yeah. the front row. I'm like, oh my God, every, every family has one. Yes, exactly. Absolutely. Exactly. But see, so then you've got all these people in the congregation in the transept, also known as obstructed view. Mm. So the majority of the congregation cannot see what's happening. Do they yes, like have I've, monitors? I mean, what, what is going on? Are they just sitting there like, they might as well be outside watching on one of the big jumbotrons. <laughs> I know. I would guess there are monitors, especially in a place like Westminster Abbey. I mean, I, I, yeah, that's my I, thought. I, I thought that was, I thought that was so funny, but you know, it's like when you buy a ticket to a sporting game and you're like, this is so amazing price and whatever. And then you get there and you're right behind the column. Yeah. I, I'm not sure. I mean, I think that they probably do have monitors. They could hear the hymns, which are so uplifting. And I thought, oh, that's but you want to see present. Yeah. Oh, totally. There's got to be TV. But screen. those aerial shots when you saw that was where it takes your breath away too to just see how full the Abbey was. And then you have Windsor as well. It just, I, but I agree, you do want an unobstructed view. <laughs> you know, and I was looking at a St. George's Chapel also. I'm like, again, crappy view. So, and it took me back to Harry and, Maggie, Harry, Harry and Meghan's wedding. And I'm thinking, so Oprah couldn't see anything. <laughs> Can't do that to Oprah. Yeah, no. George Clooney <laughs> couldn't see. They What do you do? Just sit there and play, you know, tic-tac-toe? Because it's a your... pretty small amount of seats in that actual main uh, for St. George's. Yeah. So the, everyone else is kind of in the, in the back. Um, yeah. Kate and William chose to bring the kids. That's a tough one. At what are they, nine and seven? Yes. Yep. Obviously, they're now, what are they, third and fourth in line? Was that, do you think, more so the public can see the continuation? I guess they're second and third. No, because William, because, oh, yeah, second and third. Well, yeah, William is first in line. Um, you know, I was blown away by how well behaved they were. Oh, how they were amazing. Good those kids were and they're so young and to have, see little Charlotte clasped hands in front of her and George sitting so properly. They had one little moment caught on cameras where they whispered to each other. And I, I think the lip reader said Charlotte was telling her brother when to bow his head as the queen's casket passed. So she's the one that's like the royal always on top of it, it seems like yeah um she also seems like I, bossy pants yeah. <laughs> telling her brother what to do i miss her little royal wave that yes. we used to see all the time but yeah i think it's the continuation and i think seeing you know it, it was their parents were there and they did you know kind of hold their hands for a lot of it and stuff so I don't know, yeah really i mean i think that it is a big thing to think and they are a part of history. And so them participating in this moment is something you can picture when they ascend the throne, when George potentially does, I won't, you know, no promises with anybody, I guess, um, just those images for the history books. But I can also think of the human side where but they are old enough to understand on some level what's happening and to be able to participate in this service in the morning of their grandmother, great grandmother. I think that it probably was incredibly meaningful, even if they can't comprehend that. I think that we've seen them participating in a lot more Royal occasions, different walkabouts or, um, moments with their parents. And I did like that they were sandwiched between Kate and William versus behind, because when the processional order was released, it looked like they would be behind their parents, which felt very cold. But I think Kate and William who are very protective of their privacy made sure that they had, you know, that it was a short walk that they were between their parents that they were taking care of. It's at least I felt better once I watched today. I felt very shocked last night when I saw that announcement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I don't think anyone is going to let their nine and seven year olds loose at a funeral. You've got those no. hands clamped. You're not letting go. And Prince Louis wasn't there. <laughs> yeah, yeah I after, think, you know, after all the silliness guy. at the uh, <laughs> Jubilee. But he's he a baby. He's stole a the baby. Show at the Jubilee. Oh, he's, yeah, he's a baby. He's four. And so he's, he's, he's too little to be That's there. A, it's a long day for the, those kids. I mean, I was surprised, you know, to see them again at Windsor. And I think that just, you know, I think that it was a very, very long day for them. I felt like for as traditional as it was, there were a few modern touches. 
that I really liked. Like the grandchildren having that moment standing vigil. Mm-hmm. And it was the male and the female. It was, you know, traditionally it's also male dominated. Yeah. And yet Anne was obviously, as we all believe, you know, on equal footing as were the granddaughters. Mm-hmm. And you think about when the queen became the queen, women didn't have those kinds of rights or liberties or acceptance. And I was watching and it struck me two of the speakers, three were women. Mm-hmm. And I thought you, the queen was never overtly feminist or, you know, all about women versus men, but you got to think somewhere she was smiling with women finally being treated completely as equals. It was not a male dominated ceremony at all. No, I mean, if you think about Liz Truss is only the third female prime minister they've ever had, but we've never had a female president in this country. So, I mean, it was, it was incredible to see. I mean, it's the first televised funeral. The King's funeral was just the procession was televised. It's the first televised committal service, the first televised birth. I mean, it just is really kind of, if you compare it to the last funeral of a sovereign, it's, I mean, it's history playing out in front of us and it's incredible. Let's talk about what I really care about more than anything else, the jewelry. (laughs) Okay. Let's be honest. That's my favorite. So, okay. So there's two sets of jewelry, the crown jewels, which technically belong to the state and only come out on like big occasions, like the crown and the scepter and the orb and things like that. So I'm taking those off the table. We know those, you know, that's like, you have to ask for permission. The queen has and has inherited a tremendous jewelry collection. How is this divvied up? I would assume certain pieces are bequeathed in her will to certain family members. But how is the yeah, rest I mean, of it divvied up? I know it was always did the queen lend things. There was always lending of tiaras and lending right. of earrings. How does this get divvied up now? The interesting thing is we will never see a royal will. So we will never actually officially know what gets given to whom. We will actually only know when those expert eagle-eyed royal jewelry spotters see that that is a piece of the queen's that's then worn by Megan, like she was wearing the pearl earrings the queen gave her from their first engagement, or Kate was wearing the um, three-strand pearl choker and pearl earrings given to her by the queen. So it's really all about when it appears that we kind of understand, but we know how important jewelry was to the queen. We saw that portrait released of her last night. That was such a surprise. It was a brand new picture of her. And she was wearing two aquamarine brooches given to her by her parents that she had worn throughout her Jubilee celebrations and on her 18th birthday. Um, So that's so symbolic. And so all of these pieces hold so much meaning. And I think we'll just have to wait and see who wears what items. And that's how we kind of find out. So the piece I loved of- Charlotte getting the glimpse of her little brooch with the horseshoe. I just thought that was like her first real, you know, public spotlight moment. And she had her first blingy type situation. And it was a wonderful nod to the queen. Oh, I thought so too. It was, and apparently I had read that that was actually a gift from the queen. Oh, even better. But you got it. So, so, so I'm guessing Camilla's kind of got the, the, you know, the keys to the safe. <laughs> when other royals want to borrow tiaras and jewelry. I mean, we've all heard about how many, you know, tiara gate half the time. Mm. And this one wants that one. And the, you know, the queen decides which one you get to wear. So is she now, you know, the keeper of the keys? These are all million dollar questions. I feel like you might have more of an inside track on that information than us. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm asking you. Uh, I'm not sure. I mean, I think of like, what is Angela Kelly's role? Does she have any power in in any of this as the queen's former dresser? Who is the keeper of these tiaras and jewels now going forward? It makes sense that it would be the king and queen. Right. But you can't, I, I, I I would love to know who's actually getting what, like, you know, as gifts, who, who was left? What, wouldn't that be great to know? Wouldn't that be so, so don't the wills get like after 99 years that 
they come and you, there's a chance they're open to the public. Isn't that what it was, Roberta? There's I some, the maybe will it gets of the renewed. sovereign never gets released. Oh, it never gets renewed. But, um, but I could be wrong. I could be wrong. Um, maybe that I, was with Prince either. Philip's will. Yes. I, that, that could be every 99 but years. But 99 years won't benefit uh, yeah, our information. Be no, it won't. <laughs> right. Everyone wants to know who, who gets the corgis. Oh. <gasps> Well, we do have an answer for yeah. you for this Ooh, one. Who? That is Prince Andrew and Fergie are adopting the two corgis. I didn't realize this, but I found out just now that one of the queen's corgis passed away days before she did at Balmoral. Oh, I didn't see that. So there's two remaining, Sandy and Mick, I believe is how it's pronounced. It's spelled Muick, but it's Mick and uh, Candy. One of her corgis passed away days before she did at Balmoral in Scotland. I know it's so sad. Andrew had gifted her the corgis in this la- recent month. So I think that it is very logical that they would go. And I believe there were some comments that they would be from William, that they would be very well taken care of. Well, mm-hmm. and I was shocked to see Sarah sitting with her daughters. Yeah, that was a I big was moment. Too, actually, I was, I was really surprised, especially because she hasn't been at official Royal events really at all since their divorce. Um, she wasn't at Prince Philip's funeral, but it was, it was such a show of solidarity. And I think really important to, you know, Eugenie and Beatrice who are said to be two of the queen's favorite granddaughters. So that felt really, really poignant. Yeah. I'm sure it was so meaningful for them to have their mother there. Oh, I'm sure. But it was, I, I, I was like, holy crap. When I saw her in the background, like I was like, whoa. That's Charles huge. is making changes already. <laughs> That's huge. Now, Charles has put out or a list, so to speak, or a list has been published or people found out about that if he becomes incapacitated, who can fill in for him? And yep. I'm just checking my notes here. It The list was missing some people that I thought were very interesting. Um, he's Charles is planning to change the law. So who can fill in for him as King if incapacitated excluded Harry Beatrice Andrew. And I'm assuming mm-hmm. Eugenie also. And they're because they're all non-working Royals. Yeah. So the counselors of state is a group of people that if the King, like you said, is incapacitated, that they could take over. And so that's the five people that are adults over the age of 15 in the line, uh, I'm sorry, 18 in the line of succession. Um, But because Harry and Andrew make the cut and so does Beatrice, but they are not working Royals. They are going to change that so that someone like princess Anne, who is way far down in the line of Royal succession, but is incredibly hardworking, incredibly, incredibly important to the Royal family could be in that group of people determining what happens when the King is incapacitated. So why wasn't Eugenie on the list? Well, it's the top five. So Eugenie is the younger, so she's, she doesn't, yeah, she's not the top five if they're adults in the line of succession. So obviously it like, goes like William and then it would skip George, Charlotte, Louis, of course, because they're not over the age of 18 and then so on and so forth. But yeah, and supposedly maybe Kate could be made counselor of state, which seems like it would make so much sense. Of course, she's a working royal. She's very senior. She's the Princess of Wales title. Um, so we might see a lot of changes in that department. Well, also because Charles has talk, talked about slimming down the monarchy. So who's going to get cut? I mean, I think that it will really be that core line of succession. I think that Andrew is going to be cut. Uh, who else, Roberta? Uh, I mean, it's interesting because they want to slim down, but they also have a lot of patronages yeah. to distribute now that the queen is gone. So I feel like they actually really need all hands on deck to kind of take care of everything. But there are a lot of people we don't talk about that much that we don't even, I mean, I don't even know that much about, like there's the Duke of Gloucester and, you know, princess Michael. And I think there's those people that are in Royal residences that maybe he's talking about, you know, let's free up some space for the great grandkid or the grandkids. So that I think there's a lot of that going on. There's huge amount of British Royal family members. And a lot of them, we just don't talk about, but they are, living sort of off the taxpayer money with the Royal residences and, and um, 
et cetera. Ooh, yeah, I think Charles has such grand plans that I'm really excited to see because even he's talked about opening up a lot of the um, houses and castles and palaces to the public more. I'm really, I think, you know, he's had so much time to develop what his reign would look like. So I think Roberta and I were just talking about how this is the end, but it's also such a huge beginning and there's going to be a lot to follow along with. So, of course, we have to talk about Harry and Meghan because we would be remiss because there was all sorts of drama surrounding them this trip they what people don't think i I don't think a lot of people know they happen to be in the uk for a separate event so why did they find out so late when the rest of the family was summoned to balmoral to you know get there why were they why was harry brought told so much later than everybody else Oh, it's heartbreaking. I I feel for Harry so much because that must have been so hard to learn just five minutes before. But supposedly, I mean, the way that Charles handled things was that he told the heir of the or, you know, his son, William, first. And and then it followed a kind of order that they have um, maintained protocol dictates. And so Harry found out while he was in the air on a commercial plane up to Scotland. And I think you know, that must have been so difficult, but I, I don't know. I don't know. I think that was what I was understanding is that it was more the delay in Harry getting a flight. And then they were trying to reach him when he was up in the air to let him know. And the timing, I'm not sure why it wasn't a message much quicker to everyone at once, but the timing did not work out. And he found out a matter of minutes, I think before the public was told. Cause it seems like, okay, this is my big question. What was it on Monday or Tuesday? She met the prime minister. There were lots of photos. I mean, she's she's an old lady, but she didn't look sickly or anything like that. And two days later, boom, what is the rumor? Was it like a heart attack or a stroke or just didn't wake up? Because it seemed like they were trying to get the family there before she passed. Well, I think what I've read is also that they had an inkling that she was declining on Wednesday night and, but not in a way that was urgent enough for them to get to Balmoral. And then there was that big rush Thursday morning for all the family to get there quickly. Um, I think that there's no information. It was shocking to even be informed that there was a medical issue that we were t- publicly told because that's notoriously kept so private, but so there's no detail about what happened, but that I think contributed to the shock because she was 96 years old. That is a long life lived. And we were anticipating an end, even though we didn't want to believe it. But I think that seeing her with Liz Truss on Tuesday and then such a rapid change was what left. So everyone so stunned and scrambling. I think a lot of people covering it were really scrambling. I mean, there had to have been something. Yeah. I mean, I, I say this in all seriousness, knowing now that the queen's Corgi, her beloved Corgi died days before. I mean, that must've been really heart wrenching to know. Also, you know, we saw Prince Philip pass a year ago and she's lived for a year without her husband. And that's also hard when people are of an old age, you know, to live without their partner in life. So it was a lot of things. I thought she, she had looked you know, smiley and happy in those photos, but also very thin. And she is 96. So these things happen. So Harry and Megan, how long do you think they're going to stay in England before they go back, come back to California? I think our understanding is that they're staying through the whole official period of mourning. Which and is I think what? that that ends September 26th. Is that right, Roberta? And seven days after the funeral is what King Charles announced. Although I've seen reports that they might fly back sooner than that. Just recently, like just now, just today, um, they've been away from Archie and Lily for now, like 20 days. So I'm sure they're just itching to get back to their kids. Yeah. That part is so staggering to me too. It's just, I always think of the kids and just how they, they were on a pseudo tour, you know, for their philanthropic initiatives and to not to have it extend so much longer and not see their children. Well, why wouldn't you guys have the kids flown over? It's not like they don't have staff. I mean, yeah, but she's only one. I feel like that could be really difficult. And I I mean, I guess also maybe they did. Like, I think that's the thing is we don't really know exactly, but we haven't seen them. Right. But I got to tell you, my mom, you know, threw me under her arm 
and got on an airplane and I picked up Cooper like a football and said, let's go. Yeah. You know, it was a lot there were of- conversations about maybe Doria bringing them, but I just, I don't know what happened. And I have a feeling that that's something we just won't know because of how private. So they keep anything. Do you think with the kids. Harry's going to start to get homesick? For the UK yeah. or for Montecito? No, it seems for, like they for <laughs> everyone who, even people who don't live in Montecito get homesick for Montecito. I know. I, I feel homesick for Montecito after reading <laughs> that cut profile. But Jeez. I'm just saying this was very family oriented. Do you think, mm-hmm. do you think it's going to start to eat at him that he doesn't get to be with his family really anymore? Well, I think I have questions. Is a hybrid role p- possible now with Charles at the helm? I think that's one thing that I am thinking about. I also think watching him, you know, seeing him and William, it was the Wednesday moment where they were bringing, walking behind the coffin to Westminster Hall that really got me. And I felt totally broken up about it, but also really kind of happy for Harry because I think he's had so much time to process the grief that he's lived with his whole life. And I wonder what sort of internal, uh, sentiments he now feels being on the other side or working through that and having better understanding of, of his feelings and emotions behind the trauma with his mother and doing that same exact move back then. Yeah. And I think too, like his homesickness, he was never supposed to be, I think they always wanted to be going between London and the U S And the pandemic really hindered that. And so they did kind of, you know, hunker down in California, but it does seem like they really want like their tour that they were just on until the queen passed. That was something that seems like they were really fulfilling that role that they wanted, which was to be a part of these charities, but also be independent. And so who knows, we might see them a lot in, in the UK and across Europe. One more thing to add on that though, is I'm not sure how homesick he'll feel with just the, the scrutiny of the tabloids that they've endured this week. I think that they have been damned if they do and damned if they don't. And it's been pretty, crazy to watch just the articles being put up and then removed and just, you know, they're Megan in particular is just always under such scrutiny. That's very, I think unfair. Really? Yeah. I think it's just, it's so intense and directed at her, even when she kind of fades into the background and isn't doing anything, she's still scrutinized to a degree that is not the same as everyone else. No. Yeah. It is true, but you, they kind of brought that on themselves. I mean, I would argue that they haven't really done much to warrant any scrutiny in the past week. And yet the tabloids have gone crazy about every little detail well, because they, you know, they just because of the history. Well, but it, even the uniform debacle, for example, is a perfect example of something that Harry's folks, people had to even shut down and say, listen, We want the focus to be on the queen and her funeral. We don't want anything else to get in the way. It's okay that he's not allowed to wear his military uniform. Like just shut it down. But it was such a hot debate. It was the headlines about whether Harry could wear his military uniform again or not, because Andrew was being able to wear his. I think that's gotta be really hard. It's gotta be really hard to feel like, yeah, damned if you do, damned if you don't. Yeah, I mean- you know, we still, we're all excited because, I mean, but there's certain people that that's just inherent in their lives. I mean, please, Leonardo DiCaprio has been single for a month and they've already linked him to Gigi Hadid. There's just <laughs> certain people that can't, even when they try and be in the background, they can't be because of who they are. That's true. I mean, I really think that people love seeing the fab four, as they were so called in 2019 together. I think that was just so um, emotional for so many people seeing the Sussexes and the Waleses, the newly minted Waleses uh, show up at Windsor to do a walkabout. It, I mean, social media exploded. It was the front page of every newspaper in the UK and over here. It seemed like it was everywhere. And it's really this desire to have Diana's boys. This is what I think the theory is that Diana's boys, everyone wants them to be okay and be reconciled. And so to see them together felt so good after so long. Um, so we'll have to see what happens in the future. I agree because it also, when they were all four together, felt very modern, brought a real sense of family uh, or a modern family to the monarchy. And I felt like there was plenty of stuff 
to go around and that people got too caught up in who has to walk first and this, but that's just history. That's just precedent. Yeah. But I know, but it, there was something so refreshing and youthful about all of them together back in the beginning. And that's what's sad. And, and, and I truly believe Charles and William both thought that with Harry, they would be much more supported and it would be a much more, um, Democratic is not the right word, but a much more evenly dispersed um, schedule. Yeah. That it really would have taken it back to being a family operation. Right, which was so fulfilling to see. And I, I think Charles's first speech as king, he called out the Sussexes and said, you know, we support them. We love them. We hope they continue their work overseas. That was a big step. I don't think a lot of people expected him to call them out by name in the same breath as William and Kate. And I think, you know, it could be a sign of what's to come. It could be a sign of walls coming down and bridges being mended. See, I thought it was brilliant that he name checked them because it (laughs) shut down anyone questioning if they were going to be welcome at events. Genius. PR move, Charles. You know, first thing. Exactly. Yeah. Just say, you know, get the focus off them, even though they yeah. weren't allowed at the official reception and all that. Yeah. I just kept thinking of the person extending those invites and being so stressed because there was the news about Clarence House's staff changes and that person's job. And then the, uh, the head, again, like the headlines that come out that they were invited, then disinvited. It's like someone is just struggling under a high pressure week or something. You know, that's obviously benefit of the doubt. But uh, but yeah, Charles is making moves right away. So what's next? When do we see the coronation? Months from now, maybe even a year. It's a big gap. So we have time to get some sleep and then build up our Royal fervor for that event. I'm sure that will be huge. What was your favorite? What were your favorite moments? Give me each one of your favorite, your favorite moment or your favorite two (laughs) moments. I, I absolutely broke down in sobs when I saw the Queens fell pony, Emma, did you see that moment where they shoot to the, they, um, had the the pony on the side of the long walk to Windsor Castle. And so there was all these floral tributes that they had arranged and the horse is just standing there basically alone. It has its handler next to it. And it was her favorite pony. And I thought that felt very personal because we know the queen loved horses and horse riding so much. Um, that felt like something she really requested and wanted was for her, her animals. I mean, the corgis, I thought really got me watching all of this. Yeah. I think for me, it was the cousin arrivals. I just, we talk a lot about on our podcast, how the cousins are like your extended family, the brothers and sisters you didn't have. And I think just seeing Beatrice and Eugenie and Zara Phillips, all of them arriving and just knowing that the the meaning that the queen has had to their lives and how much they're likely leaning on each other. And then to see Charlotte and George front and center with them. And, you know, Charlotte was next to Harry. I feel like just seeing everyone reunited this, the last 10 days has been so wonderful. Oh, I'm adding one more. The rainbows. Who coordinated that? I mean, seriously, that was insane. Amazing. Multiple times. Like, how is this happening? Well, over Buckingham Incredible. Palace and Windsor. Yep. And then I think over Westminster Hall last night. Yeah. Man, sometimes the weather just works in your favor. Um, mm. I think for me, the breaking of the staff. Yes. That wasn't a letdown. It was like, oh, I thought he was going to break this wooden thing across his knee or something. I did too, but obviously it was rigged so that it actually would happen. You didn't need that's to get That's a very good one. point. But, yeah. You know, that's been done for thousands of years. It's, it is a cool tradition. I was shocked that it was like magnetized, but hey, I mean, they still did it. And that was... That was so interesting. We, there was also, oh, go ahead. Rachel. No, I was just gonna say, we were stressed for the Lord Chamberlain, I believe it was, that was moving the Imperial crown and the scepter and the orb and just the eye contact made to confirm that they were actually held properly. Imagine dropping that when everyone is watching and <clears throat> those are the jobs that you kind of feel anxiety for those people. Oh, I yeah. was terrified every time they were carrying the coffin upstairs. Every, yeah. oh, oh my gosh. And I thought they must have drilled those little holders into that coffin because it was like, is it going to slide back? Where's the crown going to go? It's yeah. heavy. Yeah, it's heavy. It was a steep set of stairs into St. George's Chapel. That's for sure. Yeah, I was, that scared the hell out of me. Well, ladies, thank you so much. What a spectacular event we all got to witness. 
history. Thank you so much for having us. It really is so lovely to be here.